identify himself. And we, if we had to identify ourselves, identify ourselves with the man like Reichenthal, we were not German, so they would have known immediately that we were Jewish and we would have been arrested. The deportation began again. And at, at this stage, in 1944 already, the Jewish people knew about the crematoria, they knew about the gas chamber. There were two people that actually escaped Auschwitz, two Slovak people. Uh, they're, they're very famous, they made a film uh, of them and everything. They come uh, to uh, Slovakia and for the first time told the leadership what's going on. Uh, and they were so surprised that they didn't believe them. They couldn't believe them. This man told them that every day thousands of Jews are being gassed in Birkenau and Auschwitz. And so they put them in separate rooms and interrogated them and they found out that they're actually telling the same story that uh, they believe one of them, uh, uh, Matt Truman as well, he was sent to America to tell them what's going on in Auschwitz. So, we knew what was happening, so you can imagine how frightened we were. But the man that helped us was the priest of the village. His name was Ladislav Harangozo. He was a good man, and he socialized with my parents. They used to, every week, they used to play cards, uh, have a drinks together. He socialized with my parents because he was a Hungarian. My parents were educated in Hungary and in Slovakia it was uh, prohibited to speak Hungarian. So when my parents came and they were playing cards and having drink, very low um, uh, voice, they used to speak among themselves in Hungarian because the priest couldn't speak to anybody in the village uh, because nobody spoke Hungarian in the village. So he was a very good friend of our family. And uh, one day when uh, they were playing card, my mother said to Father Harangozo, you know, we need help. Uh, can you help us? He said, well, what's the problem? And she explained to him that we want to move. We need false paper with a Slovak man. Can you get us a, a, a false uh, uh, paper? Of course, he buried many people, so he obviously had false paper. And uh, the name uh, that we were given was uh, Vida. Vida was a typical Slovak name. Just like in Ireland you would have Murphy or O'Connor is a typical Irish name. So we got this document, we could move freely, nobody will suspect that we were uh, Jews. I remember my mother told me several times a day, from today your name is Thomas Vida, because if you say uh, Thomas Reichenthal, we will be betrayed and terrible things will happen to you. And so, uh, uh, I remember it still today because every day she would remind me again and again. And so it was on uh, uh, sometime in September uh, that we moved to Bratislava uh, where we uh, were going to stay a couple of days and then move to this new village and pretend that we were Gentiles. At the time, even the priest took us and gave us a couple of lessons about the Roman Catholic religion because we couldn't just roam the street. Uh, we had to go to school because immediately people will suspect something is not right. And so he's, he offered us to teach us, so he taught us the prayers that the children uh, pray before the school they start about the holy days in the Roman Catholic calendar, how to cross ourselves, how to make a grace, about the station of the cross, all these uh, uh, basic little things that we were not totally ignorant if we go to school and when they have the religious classes, we could get 
involved. Now, what the police did for us at the time, uh, if he was found out, uh, he would have been taken out of the church, put to the wall, and they would have shot him. They wouldn't put him on trial. Mm. This was a, a terrible crime, uh, giving Jewish people false paper and then teaching uh, Jewish children. So it was very heroic of him to do this. He practically put his life online and when I went to Slovakia about 40 odd years later, I actually visited in the, in the village and I went to the graveyard where Father Haram was, uh, was buried. He died in 1976. And in my own way, I made a little prayer and thanked him uh, what he did for us, even though in the end, unfortunately, it, it didn't help us. We were in Bratislava and we had to pick up my grandmother, my uh, mother's mother, and uh, my mother put us in a little uh, photographic shop to wait for her and she will pick us up. But unfortunately, my grandmother was betrayed and uh, there was Gestapo and police in the uh, in, in the shop and uh, my mother saw my grandmother was beaten up all uh, black and blue in the in the face and she knew something was uh, something happened uh, my grandmother was about 76 year old at the time and 76 at the time was a very old age and the police the Gestapo knew that she couldn't look after herself so they beat her up to give the man who is looking after her. It was a daughter and son, and um, she had to give the name. When my mother came in and showed her uh, document, she pretended that she came uh, to collect some laundry uh, because uh, she thought that way uh, she get away with it. Unfortunately, the police did not uh, change her maiden name in this false paper. In other words, it was, uh, my mother was born Shaimovic, and of course my grandmother was Rosalia Shaimovic. Uh, the police immediately knew that my mother was the daughter, uh, my mother was arrested, and when they opened the uh, cases, uh, they uh, found children close, and they said to my mother, where are your children? If you don't tell us, we beat you up so much that in the end you will have to tell us. So she told him where we were and we were waiting in this photographic shop. And next thing these two Gestapo entered. We knew that they were Gestapo. They had a long leather coat with swastika on the arm, hat and boot. We know this was the uniform of the Gestapo. They come to my brother and said, you Jewish? And my brother said, no, I'm not Jewish. My name is Miklos Vida. There is a name like Vida. We thought uh, nobody will uh, think that we were Jewish, but of course they knew who we were. And he asked again two or three times, and the next thing he began to beat him. My brother was at the time nearly 13 years old and he still wouldn't tell them, he was quite old. I was sitting beside him, I was nine years old at the time, and he turned around to me and said, but you Jewish? And I again sang the same song, I'm not Jewish, my name is Thomas Vida. And uh, again he asked me two or three times, and next thing, I was getting it from one side to another. I was crying, I was hurting. When my brother saw it, he jumped up and said, please stop, stop beating him. Uh, we are Jewish. And we were taken uh, to the uh, uh, shop and from there to Gestapo headquarters. I just wanted to uh, mention, I didn't mention it before, but while we were waiting in Bratislava, uh, my father was betrayed in the village and he was taken away. We thought at the time that says we will never see my father again. 
Of course, I didn't know, but my mother told that it, she will never see him. But after several days, as we were waiting, um, it, uh, we got a postcard from my father. There were four words, I'm alive, don't worry. That was the last thing we heard from my father. But thankfully, after the war, we were reunited. My father actually jumped uh, from the cattle cart uh, uh, in the night when he was being taken uh, probably to Auschwitz and he wouldn't have been, he wouldn't have survived. But there was somebody in the carriage, uh, he was a crook and uh, he specialized in breaking in places. He put a saw blade in the handle of the suitcase. I don't know if you saw cattle cart, it closes, it's a sliding door and outside is a hook that closes it so you can't open it from inside. But he managed to cut a hole in the door and reached out with the hand and he threw this hook to the other side, opened the carriage and said, anybody wants to save himself, jump after me. And there were three men that jumped out out of about 50 that were in because it was during the night and not everybody has the courage to jump out of a train, fast moving train into the darkness. You don't know where you're jumping, what is on the other side. But my father with these three pe two people uh, jumped out and then they went to the forest, met the uh, resistance army, the partisan, they joined them, fought with them till end of the war and he survived, thankfully. But he also heard uh, that we were taken away. And we were taken, it was on the 16th of October that we were uh, betrayed and arrested. And we were taken to a Seret uh, detention camp in Slovakia. In Seret they did the selection. I don't know if you heard about the selection, but it was a very cruel way, how they separated uh, the mothers from the father, the children from the parents. Uh, there would be a high-ranking German officer, he would uh, bring family by family front of him. Uh, the man and you men and women would go to the right, the mother, children and all people to the left. And so we were arrested, uh, 13 of us uh, from the family were arrested. There were uh, two cousins, my aunt, my mother, my brother, and a couple of uncles. And uh, we were called, it was on the 2nd of November uh, 1944, we were called to the Royal Court. And the German officer, his name was Alios Brunner. Alios Brunner played the God. He decided who is going to live and who is going to die. And so when our family was called up, there were 13 of us, and uh, my uncle, aunt, and uh, uh, cousin, they went to the right. Uh, my grandmother, uh, my aunt, one of my cousin and mother, uh, brother, and myself to the left. Now there were seven to the right and six to the left. I remember at the time my aunt didn't have even time uh, to kiss her husband. The husband went to the right, uh, she went uh, to the left. We just waved goodbye uh, to them and said when it's all over we will be reunited. But the group on the right side went to Sachsenhausen and Buchenwald. Buchenwald was a slave labor camp. The inmate work in stone quarry. It was November, December, January, in deep uh, uh, winter. It was very, very uh, cold. Buchenwald is in northern Germany, Sachsenhausen, all not far from Berlin. And uh, the life expectancy in Buchenwald was between three to four months. They, they walked uh, in stone quarry 12 hours a day with very little food. 
uh, this disease. So unfortunately, out of the seven, only one person survived. It was my cousin, he was 15 years old. The rest of them, one aunt in Sachsenhausen and five uh, in uh, Buchenwald, uh, unfortunately, died. So when we waved goodbye to them, this was the last time we saw them. We were put into cattle car, and I remember at the moment, I will never forget it, uh, it, it I consider it one of the most uh, horrific experiences, because here we were standing in front of this uh, cattle car before we uh, were going in. Uh, we were fed, we were uh, dressed uh, still uh, nice, and we were civilized people. And the moment the cattle cart door closed behind us, we were in this cart, about 50 of us. Now, as I said, I don't know if you saw a cattle cart, it's not very big. In the middle there was an open bar with a couple of buckets that served as the toilet. Once the door closed behind us, we became like animals. And this happened from one minute to the next. So the change in our situation was so drastic that uh, it's very difficult uh, to describe. Uh, there was no privacy. You did you think in front of everybody the stench was unbearable. We had very little water, only drinking water. So we had no hygiene. It was very, very cold when the uh, the train was going, this was November, December, <coughs> so and, uh, cattle cart, the, the, the gaps in the doors, so the cold wind was coming into the uh, car. So we were in a desperate situation, and all this happened from one moment uh, to the next. We traveled like this seven days and night. Uh, one woman actually died in the carriage and I remember the body was lying in front of me. I was only nine years old for the first time. I saw a dead person, you know, you frighten, you think I don't know what will happen. But uh, in this condition, we were seven days occasionally, and the train would stop, they would empty the barrel, they would give us a little water and they give us uh, food and we continue. It was on the seventh day, on the 9th of the November 1944, that the door suddenly opened and we were greeted uh, with shouts, rouse, rouse, schnell, schnell, out, out, quickly, quickly. They were assessed soldier with weapon, with uh, Alsatian dog barking, it was very, very frightening. We didn't know what is going to happen. It was raining, it was cold, we had no protective clothing. We were put into rows and taken on a march that took about two and a half hours. Not on the road, but through a forest for the simple reason that the Germans did not want to show what they were doing to the Jews. The ground was very soggy, very difficult to walk. And from each side we had the soldier with the weapon pushing us, schnell, schnell. And we were very worried, of course, of my grandmother if she will survive this ordeal. But after two and a half hours on the horizon, we suddenly saw this chimney with glow coming out. So you can imagine what the adults among us were thinking, because as children, we didn't know anything, but the adults already knew what that chimney meant. They already heard about the crematoria. They heard about the gas chamber. So you can imagine what they were thinking. I remember still today that my mother suddenly squeezed me to her body and also my brother, because what she was thinking was, this is the last minute, maybe hour, that we are walking on this earth. That's where we are going, where the chimneys. And we were led uh, to this large uh, barbed wire gate. There were watchtower on each side. 
uh, with soldier, with machine gun, a uh, searchlight lighting on us, and we were brought to this uh, a big hut and told to go to sleep. There were bomb bed, three bed, uh, one over the other. We took two of these bed, and we were so exhausted because in these trains, you wherever you sat or wherever you stood, you were there seven days. You couldn't move. I mean, we were about 50 of us, so you were in the same spot all the time, and the only movement you had to getting up, stand for an hour or two, and then sit down and sit Koprova. And that was the only exercise or movement that you had. So it was horrific experience. We came, it was for the first time that we were able to stretch ourselves on the bed, and we fell asleep right away, as we were so soaked, uh, wet, and the shoes and everything. We didn't take anything off just uh, went to sleep. It felt like a couple of minutes and the next thing the shrieks and shouting, rouse, uh, rouse, out sail up hill, out, out, to roll call. And at the roll call we were told that we are in Belgian person. We did not know where Belgian person was, we didn't know what Belgian person was. But it took a couple of days uh, to several days to find out that Belgian person was a detention camp, not an extermination camp, that Belgian person was in northern Germany, not far from Hamburg, uh, that Belgian person was built in 1939, uh, first of all to hold uh, prisoners of war from France, Belgium, mm -hmm. later on from Poland and Russia, and in 1943, the German authority decided to convert the camp to hold the inmate, about 25,000 inmates, mainly Jews, but they were also Jehovah Witnesses, and they were gypsies, they were German political prisoners, they were not treated any better than the Jews, uh, gay and lesbian, so the camp was divided in about six parts and then there was the men camp and women camp. When we arrived there, the only way to describe what we saw was help on earth. That's the only way that we could describe it. We saw these figures walking aimlessly around, uh, very, very sick, very, very slowly, we didn't even know if they were women or men, the shaved head with striped uniform. Occasionally they would fall down. And as children we used to play, we had sort of a, a green area where we used to play and chase each other. And when we saw one of these uh, uh, people falling down, of course we eventually found out that we were in a women's camp where the uh, Belgian bells in hospital was. And when I say hospital, you think uh, people were treated there. No. In Belgian bells in hospital were the very uh, sick people brought in, mortally sick. And they basically came there to die. And these, was the, these were the women that we were seeing. They were mortally sick and they used to fall down. And when they fell down, we stopped playing and we would watch them because we learned very quickly that if they get up within the next couple of minutes they have another day to live but in most cases and they never got up so we actually were watching them as they were dying and this was happening every day every day we saw people dying in front of our eyes and sometimes they got up and we continued to play and satisfied that she's still alive. The life in Bergen Belsen was a very difficult life. Uh, the uh, system was very strict. We were treated like animals. Uh, we were being shouted all the time. Our mothers were called all the names, very insulting, which was uh, dreadful. And our supervisor were 
uh, as a woman, they were only in their, their 20s, 23, 24 year old. And they were very cruel. Anything you did that was out of the line, you got punished for, you were beaten for. We experienced one beating one woman. She directly uh, spoke to one of these uh, SS women. She had a complaint to do. Of course, we were not allowed to speak to this woman directly. We had to speak to the leader of the hut. And this woman, uh, she had some complaint and she uh, told of the SS woman and she just took to this woman outside. We had to start in a stand in a moon shape all around and she started to beat her until she fell down and then she was uh, kicking her. Obviously she fainted. Whether she survived, I can't even remember today. But we saw a lot of uh, beating and punishment uh, giving out. The roll call would last at least an hour to an hour and a half. We stood outside in freezing cold. The temperature used to drop to minus 10, 15, and minus 20, sometimes even over that temperature. We had to stand there for an hour till the supervisor came, and then he, we had to answer to our name. We lost our name. We had a number on our jacket or whatever we were wearing and when my number was called I had to say yeah and sometimes they made a mistake and they started all over again and we were absolutely uh, freezing. After the roll call we had our breakfast. A breakfast consisted of two slices of bread and black coffee. The coffee was really the liquid uh, for our day because the water in the taps was contaminated, it was not clean. And if you drank the water from the tap, uh, you would get diarrhea, you would get dehydrated, eventually you had no strength to uh, pick, uh, collect your food, and finally you die. And also you could get typhoid. Typhoid was the, uh, typhus was the biggest killer in Belgian Belsen. As I mentioned, Belgian Belsen was detention camp. It wasn't an extermination camp. In other words, we didn't have a gas chamber, we didn't have any uh, mass execution in Belgian Belsen. Uh, in Belgian Belsen, people were dying from uh, starvation, uh, from cold, and from disease. The biggest killer was Typhus, as I say. Even though Bengel, Bergen Belsen was not an extermination camp, in Bergen Belsen over 70,000 people died. And the death in Bergen Belsen was horrific. It wasn't that if you got typhoid, uh, you were dead within three or four days. You lived for weeks, sometimes months. So it was a very painful death. And sometimes these inmates, they just couldn't bear this pain of dying. And during the night, they would run towards the barbed wire. Of course, the, uh, on the perimeter, of course, the guard in the watchtower would see them. And as they were climbing, they would shoot them. And we used to hear these shots being fired uh, every night because we were about 300 yards from the perimeter. And in the morning, we would find corpses on the barbed wire, uh, maybe two or three. And that used to happen all around the camp. So every night, uh, several dozen were killed uh, this way. These people didn't uh, try to escape. It was impossible to escape. These people just wanted to end it. They committed a suicide. Of course, people uh, died from uh, starvation uh, and there was this uh, special commando uh, uh, what they call Zonde commando these were men that come from the main camp they would have this cart with two wheels and they would go to every hut <coughs> and ask if anybody died during the night 
they would pick up the corpses, uh, throw it into the cart. Once the cart was full, it would be brought to the mortuary, which was not far from us, maybe uh, 80, 100 corpses, and in the evening, the, the uh, cart with holes or a lorry would come, pick up all these corpses, they were brought to the crematoria and born. That crematoria went 24 hours a day, every day from the day we arrived uh, till several days to our liberation. During the day, the smoke was coming up, which was spreading over the camp, so you could smell this uh, burning flesh, but we got used to it and later we didn't even smell it in the night. We could so see this uh, glow, the fire coming up. So uh, this is what we saw when we <coughs> come to the uh, car. So the life in Bergen-Belsen was very severe, very difficult. We were starving. For lunch we would get uh, turnips cut into square, boiled in water, and in the evening again, two slices of bread and a cup of uh, black coffee, black water.